Hello everyone, and welcome to another video in this series where we discuss cloud databases offered by the AWS Cloud Platform, and we also look at some of the cool features offered by these databases. My name is Adit Tesamant. I'm a database specialist solutions architect, and I specialize in Amazon Aurora, Amazon RDS, and various other relational database technologies. The topic for today is Amazon Aurora and global databases. We will do a deep dive in the global database technology and see how it works, and we will also see a couple of demos so you can take advantage of the global database technology for designing multi-region disaster recovery features for your workloads or improve the performance of your multi-region database workloads. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so let's go over the agen agenda real quick. Um, we will talk about the Amazon or our global database feature and we will do a deep dive and see how the global database works. We will look at some of the common use cases, and then we will also look at the write forwarding feature, and then we'll see a few demos. So before we dive into the global database feature, let's talk about Amazon Aurora database. Amazon Aurora is a database that we built for the cloud. What we mean by that is that Amazon Aurora can take advantage of the abundance of compute and storage, um, and that is natively available on the cloud. So to take advantage of that, we decoupled the compute and the storage subsystem of Amazon Aurora so that they can scale independently. And we built a multi-tenant lock structured and a distributed database storage system. We replicate the database across hundreds of storage nodes, which makes the storage highly scalable and efficient in terms of performance. Aurora can take advantage of other native services, uh, AWS native services as well. Um, so, for example, it can take advantage of EC2, VPC, our S3 service, our Route 53 service, and more right out of the box. So, let's talk about Amazon Aurora Global Database feature. Amazon Aurora Global Database is a feature designed specifically for globally distributed applications, allowing a single Amazon Aurora database to span multiple AWS regions. So when we build our global database, our, our, our global infrastructure, we, we create multiple regions. So uh, US has multiple regions, um, Africa has regions, uh, Asia has multiple regions, Europe has regions, uh, and, and more. So essentially what this feature lets you do is it lets you take your primary database in a region and it lets you replicate it across multiple regions across the globe. So um, this actually give, lets you um, do various things. For example, if you wanted a solution where you wanted to have a fast global failover to secondary region in case something happens to the primary region, performance issues, availability issues, um, or anything else, you can take advantage of global databases to do just that. So we are replicating the global database under the covers using a physical replication technology which lets you um, recover the database in a secondary region uh, literally within minutes. And our tests have shown that the, rep the recovery of the secondary region database is usually, usually under a minute. So if you have a use case like that, you can take advantage of the global database feature. Um, a second use case is fast cross-region migration. So if you wanted to migrate a database from one region to the other, a typical use case would be you would take a backup, restore that backup, then you will use some sort of a logical form of replication, for example, binary logs in terms of um, MySQL, and then you will replicate and until the data secondary database uh, gets fully synced, um, and then you will use that secondary database for um, you know applications that are in that region. Um, because it, we are already replicating using a physical technology on our global databases, you can simply use the secondary database, promote it, um, and use that uh, for your applications in the secondary region. So um, fast cross-region migration is also a, a very uh, common use case for global databases. The replication is happening on the physical level, um, and we will talk about this technology in a couple of minutes. So the lag across regions is very low. Usually, um, we're talking a few seconds or, or even you know less than a one, less than a second. Um, because the replication is happening on the storage level and it's physical, 
um, there is little to no performance impact on your database. And we'll see in a few slides how this replication actually works. Um, since Aurora is available in MySQL and Postgres compatibility, compatibility versions, uh, for MySQL, Global Database is available for both 5.6 and 5.7 engines. For Postgres, it is available for um, engines that have compatibility 10.11 um, and 11.7 and above. So here is a visual representation of how a global database topology works. So we have a global uh, database cluster created here. In the middle of your screen, you would see that um, the primary cluster is US East. Um, in this cluster, we have a reader and a writer node. Um, just keep in mind that only your primary cluster lets you have a writer node. Um, all other clusters, all other secondary clusters can only have a reader node. Um, so your um, primary cluster has a reader and writer. Um, in this topology, US West, Europe West, and a uh, Asia Pacific Southeast are all um, secondary clusters and they're all read only. So let's see how global database actually works. So on the left hand side um, of this slide, you have your primary region. So this region one is the primary region. As you can see, it has two readers and a writer. This database storage is um, decoupled um, and all the changes are being sent to this database storage. And then in the primary region, we have a, a, a replication fleet, an outbound replication fleet, which is basically standing by to receive all the changes that are coming from the primary region. And it takes all of these changes and it sends it over or forwards it over to the secondary region uh, which has an inbound replication fleet. Um, so essentially what we're showing here is that because your database storage is decoupled and all the changes are being replayed on the storage level, we have the ability to basically take all of these changes and send it to this replication fleet, which it automatically sends it to the uh, secondary replication um, fleet in the secondary region, and then it gets replayed on the database storage layer of the of the secondary cluster and all of this is happening under the covers it's all physical replication you don't have to um, you know take care of any sort of rep logical replication here now because this is all physical replication the uh, remote reader lag is very very low typically uh, our tests have shown that even if you set up um, a global database cluster across uh, regions in a country like us east to us west um, we have seen less than one second uh, reader lag across uh, across multiple regions. Uh, the throughput on both sides is um, all is pretty high. It's essentially um, you know what you come to ex expect of an Aurora database because the replication is happening on the storage layer. It's all physical. Um, the 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 reader and writer nodes don't have to do any work, right? So they continue to do the same work they were doing before. And that's why there's no additional uh, impact of doing the replication and you continue to get the high throughput that you come to expect. Um, in our test, we have seen that if you were to promote the secondary database um, to, uh, to a primary, the recovery is um, very quick. So we have seen in our test that it's the recovery time is usually less than a minute. So here's a quick um, comparison of a logical replication topology versus the physical replication topology that we use. So um, on the left hand side you see the logical replication and what we have done in this test is we um, gradually kept increasing queries per second that we're sending to uh, to the primary and we saw that when we're using the logical replication technology um, roughly after 30 to 35,000 queries per second the lag um, spiked to hundreds of seconds, essentially became uh, kind of unsustainable after that. Um, on the physical replication technology that we use, we kept on increasing the queries per second gradually, and we saw that we were able to get all the way up to 200,000 queries per second, um, and the replication lag uh, stayed pretty low, usually you know, roughly under a second. So you can clearly see that the physical replication technology scales much better and is highly performant. 
So um, we were looking at our global database where you have readers and read replicas in the secondary region. So it benefits greatly if you have applications in the secondary region that need to, uh, that, which need to basically read the data um, so that the data is local and they get really good uh, performance for your application. What if the application also wanted to do uh, writes? So you can take advantage of, of our write forwarding feature, which was released in a, um, recently. Um, so what this feature lets you do is not only can you read from the secondary, but you can also use the same endpoints to do the, do the writes. Um, so in this slide, it's essentially the same same uh, picture from the last slide that we saw, or uh, you know the picture that we saw a couple of slides ago, where we looked at the topology. But here, um, the application also has the ability uh, in the secondary region to do the writes, and the, these writes essentially get forwarded to the primary region. They get committed on the primary region, and then they get replicated across all the secondary regions. And all of this happens under the covers. So essentially this helps you in terms of managing the endpoints. So your application doesn't have to have multiple endpoints to manage for reading uh, locally and then writing remotely. It can all do this with, uh, while using the same endpoints and then we do the redirection of the writes uh, under the covers automatically. So let's see how the write forwarding feature works. Um, so in this case, on the uh, middle of your slide uh, slide here, or in the middle of your screen here, you have your primary region, um, you have your reader and writer nodes, you have your decoupled storage, and you have your outbound replication fleet. On the left-hand side, and uh, you have your secondary region in Oregon, um, and you have your storage and the reader nodes, and it ha you have your inbound replication fleet. Now what happens is, um, let's say in the secondary region, your application B tries to make some uh, writes um, to the secondary region cluster. Um, so the app writes to the read replica in the secondary region. Um, what happens is the secondary region repl read replica is essentially going to um, forward on that write to the primary region. Uh, the primary region is going to acknowledge and commit that transaction and then it's going to replicate uh, the update to all the other regions, including the Oregon region um, and also the, uh, the Virginia and Ireland region that you see on the, the right hand side of your slide. All of these are secondary region. So all of this happens automatically under the covers. It's all physical replication. You don't have to make any application changes for this to work. So uh, a few more things on uh, write forwarding feature if you plan to use it. Um, is that this feature needs to be enabled on the secondary cluster level and you can do this while you're creating your global um, cluster so you can do that initially or you can also do that after the fact so if um, if you decide that you want to use the secondary region for write forwarding you can enable that uh, feature anytime now to use this capability in addition to just enabling the feature you also have to use the session level parameter Aurora Replica Read Consistency. And this uh, uh, parameter has uh, multiple values. Um, you can set it to eventual, session, and global, but you have to set this parameter to one of these values to actually do the writes on the secondary region. So let's review what these individual values mean. So if you set um, this value to eventual, uh, queries that are in a secondary AWS region that are using write forwarding um, and then the the parameter is set to eventual um, the data that these queries are seeing may be slightly stale due to replication lag so the result of write operation in the same session isn't going to be visible immediately it's going to be visible uh, after the write operation is performed on the primary and then it gets replicated to the secondary so there is going to be a little bit of lag there. Now, the uh, going a step higher, you can set this value to session. If you set this value to session, or the parameter value to session, then all queries in the secondary AWS region that uses the right forwarding can see the results of all the changes made in that session um, immediately, um, regardless of whether the transaction is committed or not. If necessary, the query is going to wait for the results to be forwarded 
uh, of the forwarded operations um, to get replicated back. So there may be some lag, but the, the idea is that you're going to see the changes um, that were made in that session. Now, if we set this value to global, um, the session is going to see all the committed cha changes um, that were done in that session, and it's going to see all the committed changes that were done in uh, the primary region and also in other secondary regions. So in this case, the delay for the, for the queries might be a little bit higher because it's basically waiting for all those changes to become available um, and, and getting to get replicated in the secondary region. Um, but you just need to be aware of what these values mean so um, you can set them appropriately and um, so that you can see the expected results in terms of uh, what gets uh, seen by your application. Um, in addition to this, you also have configurable max forwarded concurrent sessions and session timeout. Um, so you can set a value um, on the um, primary cluster where you say that the maximum number of forwarded concurrent sessions are going to be a percentage of maximum number of connections um, on the primary. So this is just to make sure that your primary uh, replica or, or your primary uh, instance doesn't get overwhelmed by all these writes that are getting forwarded from the secondary instances. So you can say, well, you know, I just want to use uh, a percent, well, let's say 20% of maximum uh, available connections on the primary um, to do the, the, to accept the writes that are coming from the secondaries. Um, in addition to this, you can also set session timeouts. So if there are write sessions that are coming in from the secondary reason, regions, um, you can say that after a certain time that these sessions haven't done any sort of work, um, just terminate them. So if there are any orphan connections that are coming from the secondary regions, um, they're going to get terminated after that um, idle timeout. You need to be aware of certain limitations um, of the write forwarding too. So there are things that you can do with write forwarding such as uh, data definition language. So like create table, alter table, create index, those kind of commands are not gonna work. Um, you can't use log table and flush table statements on the secondary clusters um, with write forwarding turned on within that session. Um, you can't do things like XA transactions. Um, you can't run load data in file um, or load XML local in file kind of commands. Uh, on the cluster that has write forwarding enabled. Um, you can't run save point and roll back that save point command. So just, you know, take a look at our documentation for a complete list. This list will change um, from time to time as, as we add new features. Um, so just make sure that you, you're aware of some of these limitations so your application doesn't see uh, some sort of unexpected behavior. Okay, so the, that's all the um, information that I wanted to cover in terms of uh, global databases feature. Um, so let's go ahead and look at some demos. Okay, so let's start by creating a brand new global database cluster. Um, if you already have an Aurora cluster, you can also do an in-place upgrade by adding a new region. Um, in this demonstration, we're just going to create a brand new cluster. So um, I'm already in the Amazon RDS console. I'm going to go ahead and click on Create Database. I'm going to select Amazon Aurora, uh, leave it at MySQL compatibility, and choose the latest MySQL version, which is uh, MySQL 5.7 uh, 2.09.0. Uh, on the right-hand side, you will see um, it calls out exactly which versions are compatible with global database and 2.09.0 is so we're good there uh, we're not going to make too many changes uh, i'm going to change the database cluster identifier to um, global region one just so that we can identify uh, later which region is primary and which region is secondary now, uh, before we move ahead, I just wanted to call out something that is very important, um, that the global database spans multiple regions. So it's important that when you're creating the primary region, um, you are in appropriate regions. So here, if you see on the top right-hand corner, I am in the North Virginia region. So when you're running this wizard uh, of the database creation, make sure that you're in appropriate region. When we add uh, the other 
uh, region to this global cluster, we will make sure that we are calling out the appropriate region that is going to be our secondary. So in this case, our primary is US East 1, which is North Virginia um, right here, as you can see. So that's what I'm calling out. Uh, let's put in some password here. Uh, and I'm not going to spend too much time uh, talking through these options. Uh, we have several videos on creating instances and documentation. Uh, feel free to refer that. But right now I'm just uh, leaving everything as uh, defaults and uh, make sure we provide an initial database name. I'm choosing DB1, uh, which is the database we'll use for uh, the demos in, in a few minutes. And we are going to scroll down all the way to the bottom. We are going to remove enable deletion protection. Um, you can leave it on. Uh, it just makes it deleting database later after the labs are complete or the demo is complete. So that's why I'm uh, disabling it. You, um, you can leave it on if you want. And then click on create database. Okay, so it took several minutes for this cluster to be created. Um, but now I'm back in the database databases dashboard in my AWS console. Um, and as you can see, the cluster is now ready. So let's go ahead and click on that. Um, this cluster has a reader and a writer, and this uh, primary cluster is now in the North Virginia or US East 1 region. So what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and click on the actions menu here, and then we're going to click on add region. We are gonna pick a name for our database. So I'm going to use global cluster. You can choose whatever you want. And then we're gonna choose our secondary region. In this case, I'm going to choose US West one or uh, California. I'm gonna leave most of these uh, at their defaults. Um, just choose the appropriate VPC and um, I'm also going to enable read replica write forwarding as uh, we discussed this feature during the initial um, slides that we looked at. So I'm going to enable read replica write forwarding and we'll um, do a couple of demos on this too. Um, I'm not going to change any additional configuration except for the name. Um, so I'm going to change the name of the secondary cluster and I'm going to call it um, global region two and then i'm going to call the instance in the secondary region global region two instance one so we are just following the same nomenclature as the primary region i'm going to leave everything else on at its default values and then i'm going to click on add region now this is going to take several minutes and um, it, after it's done, it would um, add the secondary cluster. So as you can see, the secondary cluster uh, goes into the creating phase, and then in a few minutes, it will be available. So the global database cluster is now created, um, and we have uh, our primary and secondary region. So before we do any more demos, um, let's take a look at the topology here. Um, so of course you start with your global, global cluster, which is the container for your both primary and secondary regions. Um, then you have your primary region, we have called it global region one. Um, if, as you can see, it's in US East one. And then you have your secondary region, which is global region two, um, and it's in US West one. So. Um, let's take a look at the read and write endpoint. Uh, keep in mind, as of today, there is no global endpoint, right? So uh, when I mean there is no global endpoint, as in there is not, no single endpoint that can seamlessly uh, re distribute your reads or writes to um, either regions. You have to still use the, the cluster and reader endpoints in individual regions. So if I go to the primary region, now, if you notice, when I click on a region, it opens up a separate window. This is to make sure that it takes you to the appropriate region console. So when I click on the primary region, um, if you scroll down to the connectivity and security area, 
you're going to see the global region one, uh, which is the cluster endpoint, and then this uh, second one, which is the reader endpoint. This is similar um, to your regular database cluster or regu regular uh, Aurora cluster. Let's um, look at the second region. Again, when I click on the second region, it opens up a new tab. This time you would see that it has opened up a tab in uh, US West 1 region, North California. Again, similarly, um, the topologies that we have a cluster endpoint and then we have a reader endpoint. So um, in this case though, the, the cluster endpoint or, or the endpoint that always um, points to the writer is inactive. So the reason why it's inactive is because uh, this is still a, a read cluster, right? So if there is a, a situation where you had to basically promote your secondary region, um, in that situation, this uh, inactive uh, writer endpoint will become active and you would be able to use this replica um, as an individual cluster. But that's not what we're going to do right now. Okay, so for the first demo, we're going to see how to connect to the database cluster from the secondary region. Um, and then we're going to create a table in the primary region, insert some data, and then we're going to query that data from the secondary region and see what kind of latencies we get. So for demonstration purpose, I have two EC2 instances. Um, the instance on the left-hand side is in the primary region, which is US East 1 or Virginia. And then the instance on the right-hand side is in US West 2 or California, which is our secondary um, cluster for our global cluster, or secondary region for our global cluster. So let's get started. I'm going to try to connect to the primary region. So this is my MySQL command. Um, this is the name of my server, which is global region one cluster. So let's verify um, the endpoint that I'm connecting to is right. So if you see, I'm, uh, this is my global region one, which is my primary region. Uh, and this is my endpoint name. So that's the endpoint I'm using. Um, so let's go back here and then connect to it. And I'm inside the database server. Now let's go ahead and create a simple table. So this is a simple table that has, um, you know, an identity column or sorry, an integer column um, and a, a timestamp. So um, that's all we really need here. So I'm going to exit out of a MySQL command. Now what we're going to do is we're going to basically run a Python command on the secondary region that runs in a loop and tries to um, discover new values as they get inserted um, in this table. So let me run that command from the secondary region. All right. So the this is a Python script that I've written. It's not a very complicated script. All it's doing is connecting to the endpoint and then just querying the table in a loop. So here's my endpoint, which is global region two cluster. And if you see here in its name, you see RO, which is uh, which means it's a read replica. So if I go to my secondary region, um, you're going to see that um, this is the endpoint that I'm using, right? So we looked at our topology before. Um, so we are going to be connecting to our secondary regions um, reader endpoint. So let's go back to our command line and execute this command. So this command keeps running. It's basically just taking snapshots and trying to discover new values. Um, so let's go ahead and try to insert some values into this table from the primary. All right, so I'm going to run this command from the primary, which is inserting a bunch of values in the table. As you can see on the right hand side, as I start inserting these values, you start, uh, we start seeing these inserted values almost immediately. So I'm going to exit out of both of these commands. And let's see what kind of latency we are seeing here. So if I see I inserted this value on the left hand side at um, roughly, you know, this is UTC time, so, um, you know, 7.51 and 30 seconds. So let's go ahead and try to figure out when we saw this value first on the secondary region. So again, you can see that the latency is, um, again, 7.51 um, and then 3, 360 milliseconds after. So the latency is really, really low here. So we're talking about, 
you know just maybe 100 millisecond latency um, let's let's look at another value so let's look at six and let's see when six was discovered first um, so here's six and again 75135 uh, 75136 um, this time the latency is about one second um, so you know again this is not a super scientific method right so I'm just trying to discover the value from the secondary region by just running a um, select query on it and I'm doing some ordering and things like that so this is just for demonstration purposes only all, all we're trying to show you is that replication is pretty quick and here it's few hundred milliseconds um, even though we're inserting a little bit of data but the the point is that even if you're inserting um, you know just a regular OLTP kind of data this process scales really well because the replication is going to be physical replication all right so let's try to do something else um, let's try to connect to the secondary instance and see if we can insert some data so I'm gonna put my primary region away for a second and let's clear out of this so my secondary region is a read-only instance right so this is a, a reader instance right here as you can see this is a reader um, but if you remember we also enabled read replica write forwarding right an idea here is that we should be able to insert data even though we are inserting data from the secondary um, this data should you know the the um, DML commands basically get um, sent forward to the primary so let's see if we can do that so for for that what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to connect to the secondary region and then try to insert data so let me execute this command so again I'm on secondary uh, which is US West 1 uh, I'm using the MySQL command and then using the RO or read-only instance and then connecting to it alright so I'm in in MySQL now let's try to insert some data into this table so let's just type the command right away insert And then I'm going to insert, uh, let's say 15, and then just take a timestamp of right now. Okay. So if I run this, what happens is I get this error, and it says, "Hey, you're trying to connect to a read-only database." But we just said that we have enabled um, read replica write forwarding, right? So we should be able to forward these writes to the primary. So there is a um, there's an additional detail that we have to take care of before we can actually forward these writes um, is to set the consistency for this session. Um, so before we can actually make the right change or do the writes on the secondary and take advantage of write forwarding, uh, we have to set the Aurora replica read consistency to either session uh, or global or eventual. We, uh, we discussed this when we were going through the slides. So for now, I'm just going to set it to session and then try my command again so this time I was able to insert so let's try to insert another here and then just do uh, select from this table and let's see if we can get our data and you can see that these two um, values that we just inserted from the secondary um, are in the table so hopefully this kind of demonstrates um, the use cases that you would typically see with a global database where you are not only using the global database for serving read queries but also occasionally as needed you can um, your secondary can also serve write queries and they will basically get forwarded to the primary so that concludes all the demos that i wanted to show you today Today we reviewed the Amazon Aurora Global Database technology, we saw how it works, we saw how to configure it, and we also saw a couple of demos that showed you how to take advantage of this technology to design a global disaster recovery solution, and we also saw a couple of demos that showed you how to read or write from the secondary region. Thank you so much for taking the time to go through this video today. I hope this was useful. I hope you will take advantage of the global database technology in your workloads. And as always, 
I'd like to wish you happy cloud computing from everyone here at AWS.